Hey guys, how's it going? Welcome to this week's recap video. I actually had to look through all the videos from last week to refresh myself on what we had done this last week. It just feels a little bit like a blur. Kind of a whirlwind. Yeah, I just, you know, we have a lot of projects going on and then there's a lot of projects like that we're not even doing. You know, Benny's here working on irrigation. They finished up the bricks on the Hartley. There's a lot of people just coming and going. So I just kind of had to remember like, what did I do? Yeah. <laughs> anyway, and last hot day. I think I've said that a couple of times, but at least for the next 10 days, today's 100 and tomorrow's supposed to be 84. So a 16 degree drop, you guys know what that means, right? <laughs> like pray for our trees. I'm a little bit nervous. Not normally nervous because we do get a lot of wind and we're used to that. It's not the most fun thing, but we're used to it. But after you lose a giant spruce tree that you never thought you would lose, you're kind of like, on the other hand though, I think it's been a long time since we've actually lost a tree due to wind. Like we've lost trees just on calm days. Yeah. You know? Just standing there. Like and a third like of a tree. A third of your <laughs> tree falls, falls down. down right in front of you. But can you remember the last time that we actually lost a tree? Probably the willow tree. Remember, uh, it didn't actually fall all the way down, but it just kind of uprooted and leaned. Yeah, that was a while ago. That was like three we've or not, four years have ago. Have we ever even lost an entire tree to wind? No, that I think might it's just be the first chunks. one. Yeah. yeah. So we're not doing too bad. If I had to put money on it, I would say the next tree we're going to lose would be the ash tree in the driveway. Or a willow. Or a willow. I could see yeah, one of the right. weeping willows because there's just so much for the wind to catch. You know, though, we've recently done a lot of pruning and I think that's helped. Probably. When we do, because you remember we did the maintenance video on both of the willows. We have another weeping willow that never has looked that great. It's along our back property line. Yeah. I wouldn't mind losing that willow. Is that a weepy or uh, uh, weeping or curly willow? <laughs> well, there's a curly willow and then there's the sensation box cell there and then there's oh, another yeah, you're willow. Right. You're and right. that one, both of those back there never look that great. Yeah, they great. both are bad. The curly willow gets mites every year. No matter what I do to it, it gets mites, defoliates, and now it's got green leaves again. Did you yeah. notice that? Yep. It's like yep. coming back. Anyway, so that wouldn't be a horrible loss to lose any of those, yeah. those two. But the other two, the weeping willow in front of our greenhouse and the one by Hebe, that would be a sad day. Yeah, it would be. Anyway, so it's supposed to go to 84 and then 75, I think, and then it's gonna come back up, not into the hundreds and not even into the high 90s. The next Just 10 days, at least. High 80s, low 90s. Yeah, I'll take it. Also, I wanted to update you on the quail egg situation before we jumped into our questions, uh, because we had an interesting turn of events happen with that. Um, as many of you know, I was out cleaning out a raised bed and I pulled a cabbage plant and unearthed a quail nest that I did not know was there. There was 15 eggs. Had I known there was a quail nesting underneath the cabbage, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have disrupted the area. I would have left all four cabbage sitting there just so nature could do its thing because quail are beautiful. I love watching the little baby quail running around and mm -hmm. we have a lot of quail around here. Anyway, um, so we were then faced with this decision, like what do we do here? Because we just disrupted the area so much that these eggs were 100% exposed to the full sun. It was 108 degrees that day. And the 10 day after that, it showed all temperatures above 104. So we thought, well, they're just gonna sit out here and bake in this full sun. And there's, I don't think that the quail would move, quail can't move eggs, right? Like the birds right. can't move the eggs once they have been hatched. Um, so if we tried to move them or if we tried to like shade the area somehow, I don't think that the, the adults would come back. I mean, it's possible, mm -hmm. but even if they did, even if they did and they were able to nest and hatch the eggs, there's a lot of wildlife. And because they were so exposed, we have foxes and skunks and of course there's cats all over and there's a surprising amount of dogs that cruise through our property during the day and the nights. Uh, so we thought, you know what, these, these little babies, they're like dead if we leave them here. So I have a friend with an incubator. We decided to pick up the eggs, take them to her because she hatches like chickens and ducks and things like that. She keeps birds. And um, so she was more than happy to take them. And she, the plan was to hatch them, keep them. I think you have to keep them between two and three weeks because I have to maintain a specific temperature. Like she told me 90 to 95 during that first two weeks. Um, and then after that, they're like old enough, whatever, to be released. And that was the plan just to release them. I did not realize it was illegal. It's illegal in the state of Oregon to touch any wildlife, like any wildlife, any kind. Well, there's three species of birds that are not protected, but there, it's just illegal to tamper with wildlife. So we were- It feels weird when it's on your own property, um, yeah, like it was, in your vegetable garden. Yeah, and it, I mean- 
It's our problem like is, is that we put it in a video. Yeah. <laughs> that was our problem. Um, but we were turned in. Somebody <laughs> turned us in for touching the quail eggs and trying to save them, which um, whoever turned us in was actually responsible ultimately for the death of these birds because we took them to uh, our, our friend. She incubated them. Eight of them hatched. I have video, I don't know that we can share it, because we were visited by two state troopers, yep. and they were like, obviously there was no ill intent, we just have to follow up with these things, you know? And they said the rule is in place because there are some people who they'll like run across a rent like a bear cub, or an injured eagle, or something like that, and they'll try to keep them as pets. So I get it, you know, I get why mm. that rule's in place, um, because you know, you wanna protect wildlife. Uh, which is what I was, my, that was my intention, was to protect the life of these little birds. And um, so... The, the rule is there to protect the quail. Right. You know what I which, mean? Which, which is what turn, you were attempting to do. Which was what I was attempting to do. And then, of course, they were, like, seized. <laughs> the birds were seized. And I, they, they were released at, mm -hmm. like, three days old, which they're not going to maintain the temperature. Our nights get too cold. And so pretty sure all of them are probably gone at this point, which is so sad. So whoever turned us in... <laughs> like, I don't so know what your intention was. Um, I, I understand the rule and whatever, and I know some people are very passionate about uh, protecting wildlife. Mm -hmm. I get that. So, like, I don't want to seem flippant mm -hmm. about the rules that are there or that I don't respect it, but that's what we were trying to do is we were trying to respect the life of those birds and trying to, you know, that sort of thing. We so, were trying to save them. Yeah. From a certain death. Yeah. Yeah, and you, you know, when you're in that position, you're like, well, you feel horrible. Mm -hmm. Like, if I were just to leave them out there because it's illegal, I can't touch them. Mm -hmm. Like, I get to just stand here and watch them bake in this sun. Mm -hmm. And I get to watch the mom and dad, like, freak out. And I just, like, I couldn't have stomached that either. Yeah. Anyway. Kind of an, unfor I mean, not kind of. That was a super unfortunate. We learned a lot yeah. through the process. And everybody that we dealt with was uh, incredibly sweet about the whole thing because they knew the intention involved. And I think 99.9% .9 of you guys um, recognize the intent involved too. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I just wanted to update you on that. Um, if I, I have not followed up, uh, I have one more call with one of the troopers. Anyway, just to get some closure on it, I might be able to share some video of the little babies I'm not sure but anyway on that note that was a downer I should have saved that for the end of this recap video well you don't <laughs> well, want to end on a down note I guess. no that's true let's just jump into the videos the first one is a very happy video it's candy canning candied jalapenos with my mom it's also called cowboy candy it's something my mom and I have wanted to do this season we were just waiting until we had enough jalapenos ready um, and I went out into my garden hoping to get 30 jalapenos I hadn't really looked at my plants I only thought I had planted one turns out I planted three out there I forgot and I got 185 peppers off my plants. <laughs> uh, they weren't as big as my mom's. It's really interesting. They weren't as big or as dark green, but they were, they were, they packed a punch, man. And they were starting to turn red. So they were really starting to ripen even at that smaller stage. And my mom had 30 or more on her plant. I think she just had one plant out there. But uh, anyway, it was a fun day. I took Benjamin out there with me to my parents' house. We tried to fly a kite, which it was really windy here in the morning. My parents' house is surprisingly, for being kind of positioned on a hill, it's surprisingly protected because it's kind of down on the east side of the hill and we usually get west wind from the west. So it, it just is kind of in this little bubble and I thought for sure we'd be able to fly a kite because here it was just like I almost couldn't film in the morning. Um, I had to wait to even start the video because it was so breezy. Anyway, yeah. First comment was parents garden tour uh, featuring mom soon. I love when your mom is in a video. Her vibe is just comforting. Yeah, I talked about maybe walking through my parents' garden with my mom and just kind of like doing a tour with we her. We had a plan to do that at one point. I think we just got busy. I mean, we'll, well probably... Well, she's busy too. Like, yeah. Like, you got to remember... She's really busy at Andrews. Yeah. Anyway, so most of our stuff happens when either one of us call each other in the morning and say, hey, like, what do you want to go antiquing today? <laughs> and it's usually usually one of us has something going on and we can't but every once in a while we like i called my mom that morning and said hey i think my jalapenos are about ready uh when do you want to work on canning the cowboy candy and she was like well i think i could clear this afternoon could you do that and so i cleared the afternoon too and we were able to do it so it was really it was fun anyway hopefully at some point we will do a tour through their space uh, together i think that would be fun 
The hug mug Casey said, what do you do with them? Are they used as a garnish? So the cowboy candy can be used on so many things. If you read the comment section of that video, either on YouTube or Facebook, there are a lot of good suggestions. Actually, somebody said like you put a block of cream cheese down and then pour your cowboy candy over it and just use it as a, like a dip kind of. Um, and I can imagine that would be really good. The way I eat a lot of it is, um, either with like toasted bread or cheese and crackers, cheese and crackers mainly, like a saltine cracker, and then you melt a little bit of cheddar cheese on it, and then put, usually I put like one jalapeno ring on the top and eat it that way as a snack. So good. Like there's something so, it's like a nostalgic flavor for me because that's what we used to eat all the time in the afternoons at Andrews. When I was down at the garden center working, mm -hmm. like my brother or sister, I would, we'd all be lined up in the kitchen making these little cracker, you know, plate of crackers yeah. and cheese with that cowboy candy. So yum. Um, Hallie said, how spicy is this, Laura? Uh, pretty spicy. I mean, everybody has their own limit. I like things spice, like pretty spicy. I don't like it to where it makes me sweat or I can't really taste the flavor of the food. My dad and sister like it to where like they're having to mop up, <laughs> like have a towel. They like it really spicy. Um, you're kind of more on the medium side of things, aren't you? Yeah, I don't, I like taste. I like it to taste good. I don't need it to blow my lid off. Be painful or anything. Yeah, right. Uh, the cowboy candy, you may not like it, Erin. It really? It's pretty spicy. You could seed the peppers, though, and get rid of a lot of the spice that way. And I think there's, um, are they called, somebody made a comment, no fool jalapenos or fool something. Anyway, it's a jalapeno without as much heat. That might be a good option. Rebecca said, how long after canning and sealing are they ready to eat? Is there a certain amount of time to allow the canning process to set up? How long do they store? Do you need to use the jar within a certain amount of time? I would say that you could store them for a year. That's typically what it is for most canned stuff, right? I would store it for a year and still eat it. Um, they're ready to eat right away. I've already eaten a, a jar, oh, an entire jar is gone <laughs> because I consumed it. Uh, and no, you don't need to allow a certain amount of time. You can just start eating them right away. Green Woman said, oh, the jar I ate was one of the little ones, the quarter pint, not like a half pint jar. <laughs> a green woman said, what if you don't eat sugar? Would a sugar substitute work? I don't know. I, I mean, I wonder if some kind of like a honey or something like that would work. It'd be an interesting experiment. Uh, just sitting there said, did you use biotome when you put bulbs in the ground in the fall? I lost 300 bulbs last year and cannot figure out why. Used bone meal when planting them, have PTSD now, so sad. How would you lose 300? That's a lot of bulbs to lose. Yeah, it I is. use bulb tone when I plant. Um, I think bone meal is great to, to use when you plant. I don't know why you would have lost them, other than the fact that maybe, like, were they watered in? Is it possible that, you know, the, they dry out? Yeah. Yeah, that they dried, that dried out or they got or too rot. soggy and rotted. Those would probably be the two most likely explanations. Bummer, I'm sorry about that. That's that's a huge loss, that's a bummer. They said, how can you stop squirrels from digging up bulbs and plants from planters? I'm getting discouraged. It seems my tulips have all disappeared and the gravel around planters now has enough soil to grow some tall weeds. Su suggestions, please. A lot of people will use chicken wire or some kind of wire something on the top of areas that squirrels want to dig in because I don't know, there are some repellents that you can put down. Um, so what's it called? Repels all. Um, I haven't tested it thoroughly against squirrels though, because we don't have a lot. Our neighbors, we just noticed some squirrels up in their walnut trees. We had squirrels when we had our oak trees here, but when those were removed, I haven't really seen, like I'll see a squirrel here and there, yeah. but I don't see a tremendous amount of squirrel activity and they don't mess with our bulbs. I mean, I, hopefully that doesn't happen in the future, but I know a lot of people will use repellents and or like plant their bulbs and then put something over the top. Just roll out chicken wire um, to where they can't dig in the area. That's helpful for if you have cats too in your area, keep them out of your flower beds. SM Elder said, how do you cope with the dying foliage of daffodils? I actually don't mind it. I used to mind it, I think more. I, I think that tulips have the worst looking leaves when they're starting to, to die um, because they're so much more bold. Daffodils have more of a grassy, strappy kind of texture to me. And I just, I just don't mind it as much. This year though, I feel like I relaxed a little bit about some of those things and I think it's just because of the sheer amount of <laughs> chaos that's going in other places of our garden. I'm like, well, at least there's a plant there. That's good. We'll enjoy another daffodil there next year. It'll be fine. Um, and we just eventually cleaned up the daffodil leaves as they, they went. But 
Lisa said, should I consider spring bulbs as annuals? You know, a lot of people do. Uh, you know, in our area, tulips do not naturalize very well, so I would probably be better off planning for them to be annuals. If I wanted a really strong show in a particular area, I would just make sure to replant. For me though, you know, I plant, enjoy them that first year really strong. And then typically, you know, some mixes do really well, like the Vidal, white mix, Vidal, I think mm -hmm. that's what it's called, from Color Blends is amazing. That has been the strongest returning mix of, of tulips I've ever planted. But in other areas, like the Gamay blend is beautiful. It didn't come up super strong. For, no, it did. No, it wasn't the, it was the Pinotage. Gamay came up strong. Pinotage came up a little bit weak behind our chicken coop, but it doesn't matter to me. I still enjoy the tulips that do come up. If, uh, yeah, so it depends on your climate, depends on where you are. I, I have been really uh, focusing hard on daffodils because they are so reliable to come back from year to year that I've been just focusing on planting more of those so that I know that they will return. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I think, yeah, it just depends on your area and how strong of a mix or how strong of a look you want in whatever area of your garden. Uh, Renee said, when you say you ordered a bunch, in Laura's world, what is a bunch? <laughs> I don't want to answer that. <laughs> to me, a bunch is 25 uh, and a ton is 100. Well, last year we planted 7,500 bulbs. And this year, we're going to double it. <laughs> A little more than that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Eugenia said, Laura, did you find that the tulip colors are enhanced in the catalog versus real life? Are they true to colors pictured? Color Blends is right on the money. Color Blends catalog is awesome. There is another bulb provider, which I'm not going to name, you probably already know, who just like saturates the crap out of their pictures. And it makes me irritated because I know it. You, and you probably know it too. You look at these, these daffodils that have pink centers. Like that has been saturated so hard. They don't have that pink of centers or like alliums that look so vivid, like glowing blue. Hmm, that's not real. <laughs> Color blends is right on and I appreciate like straight up. Like, the honesty. The honesty, <laughs> yes. Next video is weeding the new grass and planting dogwoods and ornamental grass. So our front lawn is pretty much up. You seeded some more grass this week, right? And like the bare spots well where we had the the lake the pond, the pond yeah from all the rain uh it just didn't take in that it spot. like rotted out the grass that yeah. was there it rotted out the weeds in that area too hey yeah <laughs> we'll take it so, well not the grassy weeds though it's like the reeds yeah. have grown right <laughs> yeah there's like a certain type of grass like a crab grass type mm -hmm. that is still alive over there yeah but yeah i reseeded um, so it's coming in, it's looking really pretty. And if you look at it with crossed eyes or just out of the side of your eye, it looks beautiful and like this carpet of green. But if you actually look at it real, you can see all the weeds that are out there. So I just needed to get out and, and weed. I mean, it, it, the other, there's a lot of weeds in there. The most important one to get out right now is puncture vine because they are starting to set their seed, but they haven't dropped them yet. Um, but they're massive. Like some of them are huge weeds. Um, so it's fairly satisfying because you can pull one weed and it clears an enormous section. And then in other areas, they're really thick, but we wanted to make sure to get those pulled up before they, they drop their seeds and create a whole new crop. Um, Anyway, we're still not done, but we're working on it here and there, and it's looking better and better. I actually uh, was laying in bed the other night and remembered that weeding tool that Hoselink set out, sent out. That's a brand new weeding tool, and I we just showed you in another video that's not up yet. It might be up by the time you watch this, but um, I was laying in bed and thought, I have been on my hands and knees weeding these puncture vines when I have that stand-up weeding tool that I could easily pop these huge weeds out and not ever have to bend down. It's like one of those uh, moments. Anyway, so I took that out the next day and I had a whole pop-up bag full within like, what, five, 10 minutes yeah. of puncture vines and I never had to bend down once. That weeding tool is worth its weight. Actually, I think we might order another one. Yeah. Cause honestly, that was an amazing thing. Anyway, at the end of that, after I weeded the grass, we planted three Arctic yellow, Arctic fire yellow dogwoods and three prairie winds, Apache rose. Which ones did I plant? Not prairie winds. Apache rose, panicum. Yeah, that Pretty might, sure that that, that was right. the one I planted. Uh, Glenda said, impressive difference. My dad always said, don't look at how far you have to go. Look at how far you've come. Look at all you did, Laura. Such a beautiful difference. It was very satisfying. I decided to start up close to the house because we sit out there in the evenings a lot. We sit and there's a couple chairs and I just wanted like at least the first little bit of what we were looking at to look peaceful and like, like to where we could relax and not think, oh my gosh, there's so many weeds out there. You just have to look a distance to see the weeds uh, at this point. 
Jesse said, how big is your lawn going to be? Like an acre, two acres? It's kind of hard to tell perspective from the video. Excited for the finished product. Like an acre. You think it's an acre? Yeah. Um, it won't be, let's, so there's going to be two huge flower beds up toward the house. And then we are putting in a bunch of shade trees, probably not this season, next season. Uh, we're going to keep a big patch open in the center because we are going to be reducing the lawn amount in other areas of our garden. Um, we want a big area for the kids to be able to play that's unmarked by trees and that kind of thing. Like where we could put up, I don't know, a volleyball net or, you know, they could play soccer or football or something like not a full size field, but you guys know what I mean. Like a big chunk that's open but i think eventually i will probably put in flower beds around the exterior so we'll be chipping away at some of that eventually um, but not for a while we kind of want it to look like just peaceful don't you think erin just like park setting yeah. kind of yeah is what we're going for um polly said how amazing is it that laura even knows the names of the weeds <laughs> well you weed them for enough of your life <laughs> and you start to know there's some that i don't know where I'm just like, well, that's the worst weed. I don't know what it is, but I've been weeding it my whole life. There's probably only like 10 or so that are like, maybe even less than 10 that are really prevalent in our prevalent. area. Prevalent, purslane, spurge, mm -hmm. bindweed, puncture vine. Um, kosha. Kosha, did I say buttonweed? Mm -mm. Buttonweed. Um, we do occasionally have thistles, but- Canadian thistles yeah. are the worst. But I haven't seen any of those in a long time, it feels like. I just like. weeded some out of a plant can yesterday and it just ravaged my hands. Irene said, thank you for sharing this video. I'm dealing with weeds myself. In fact, I was out weeding earlier. My grass is established. What would be the best weed killer to use or does it matter? I think it does matter. Uh, there are some people who are very, very passionate about you know the types of things that you use. I'm kind of of the mindset of, you know, use organic, which we are, and we found like, Captain Jack's a lawn weed brew for established lawns is wonderful. I think Iron Effie is, right, is the active in that one. And uh, it works really, really well for us. And then on other areas, not in the lawn. So as like a complete kill, the dead weed brew does grass and broadleaf, but lawn weed brew does just broadleaf. Um, I think the most important part though is to read those labels on organic sprays because they tend to not be quite as strong as synthetics. Um, oftentimes they'll give you a chart telling you what percentage to mix it up at. And if you're dealing with really noxious weeds in your grass or anywhere else, look at that, that uh, chart and then usually you'll need to mix it up at the strongest rate. Um, so that's where we've been having the most luck, like with the deadweed brew on puncture vines and bind weeds, which are noxious here and they're hard to control. But if you mix your deadweed brew at enough strength, it takes care of them. But like one more time, let me distinguish between lawn weed brew is for your lawns. Like it will kill broadleaf weeds out of your lawn while your lawn grass will be fine. Dead weed brew is a grass and broadleaf killer. So when I talk about both of those things, I want to make sure like it's I tough always make they sure sound so similar. they do. That's kind of, they need to kind of. One thing I do appreciate. So they're all made by Bonide and they're putting like all their best organic sprays under the Captain Jack's label. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Captain Jack's dead weed brew, lawn weed brew, mm -hmm. and then um, dead bug brew. Mm -hmm. And so those three, honestly, for your like broadleaf, non, what do you call that? Non-selective. Non mm -hmm. Yeah. And then your insecticide, if you get those three, it'll pretty you much can, cover. You can cover yeah. so much with yeah. those three and they're all organic. Well, yeah. they're they don't... all incredibly named sim Like I'm worried that one day, cause we'll oftentimes have like a friend of mine, her son came and helped us with a lot of weed control this spring and early summer. And we were very like, do not use dead bug brew or I mean dead weed brew in the dead bug brew tank. Right. It's so similar, but if we screw that up and we spray the dead weed brew on like the petunias we're spraying with a dead bug brew, like it'll kill our crop. <laughs> That's check what you're like, using. I feel like we need to have everything in separate spots of the barn. Like this is where you mix up dead bug brew. Right. This is where you do dead weed brew. But well, we do have multiple spray tanks and they're all labeled they for are what labeled. they do. But so. it's still easy to make a mistake. Yeah. Like I, I would make that mistake yeah. just when you're not thinking and you're just moving, you know? Oh my goodness. Makes me nervous. Deborah said, what type of grass are you planting? I think I missed that part. I'm not sure I ever said. I mean, I've said before, but we do a mix. It's called the lawn mix. It's the most popular grass in our area, which is a Kentucky blue perennial rye blend. It does really well in Northern climates. Is it 50, 50 um, or is it 60, 40? I know a lot of times they're 60, 40. I can't remember. I used to know that when I worked down there, I know a pound of it covers 250 square feet. Oh, how about that. Yeah, I do know that. I know for you, a pound covers about 
50 An square inch. feet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Aaron plants heavy, which is good. Comes up usually nice and thick. Betty said the dogwood bushes are nice, but do you have any dogwood trees? I'm in a zone like yours, and mine struggles every summer. Too hot. I think they're what you would call in hot climates, like a under... What is that called, Aaron? Where it's like a... Um, oh, jeez. I can't remember. Where you put stuff kind of protected. An underplant? An, uh, an understory? Know, understory tree. Yeah. yeah. Something that is protected either from harsh winds or from incredibly hot sun that, you know, like we have here. Dogwoods kind of struggle in our area, too. I, you know, dug up the Venus dogwood that was behind our fireplace, which every year it had struggled. It was there for a couple of seasons. When we dug it up, it had hardly any root system. I don't know what happened to the root system, but it was almost gone. We planted it right out in the middle of nowhere. It really had no chance, but we, um, I, don't, I think it would have eventually died where it was anyway. And do I have any other, do I have a June snow dogwood tree, which is doing great uh, so far. It's like opposite the mulberry tree in the flower bed, right by where the blue spruce fell down. Mm -hmm. It's like right next to it, kind of. And it's been there for a couple seasons and it doesn't really falter, but now it's going to be uh, subjected to a little more sun now that the spruce is gone. So we'll see what happens. Before it was kind of the perfect location for it. So I'm hoping that it, it survives. Uh, next video was planting Heliopsis and harvesting artichokes to dry. So I had, uh, I think like 19 of the Tuscan Sun Heliopsis we put in the ground out on the new property along the main lane to the cut flower garden. I thought it'd be a really pretty low maintenance perennial because there are some types of perennials that like, like you don't have to ma maintain because you're not cutting back a early flush of blooms. Like salvias, they come up bloom beautifully, then you cut them back, they look kind of rant for several weeks before they start flushing back and bloom again for you in the season. So you've got that little extra, like one, the time where you don't have a plant there basically, and then the extra layer of maintenance. But if I can put some things like the Heliopsis, Echinacea, Sedums, those types of plants that you don't have to cut back in the middle of the season. Uh, it's just once a year cut back and you don't have to deadhead them. Those are the kinds of things I'm looking for out there. So I thought the Heliopsis would be a beautiful, bright color, bright spot out there. And I also do have denim and lace, which is a perennial as well, Russian sage. So having that purple spiky with the yellow, bright yellow, I think it'll be really pretty. Uh, and then all of my artichokes are just kind of starting to go like starting to bloom. And I really, I grew them as an experiment. I'm not like a huge one to eat artichokes, but um, I wanted to grow them one just to grow it. I like to just experiment with whatever and they grew beautifully like better than I could have ever expected. I mean, so many artichokes per plant. I counted one plant early on that had 14 on it, and I'm sure it's produced more. There were more buds coming up, uh, but they're gorgeous. This right here is one of them that I cut in that video and brought in here to dry. So you can see that the leaves are starting to dry up, atrophy a little bit. These still feel, feel pretty moist. They're still a really nice color. Uh, I think they're probably just drawing energy from the bulb there uh, and they'll eventually dry out. And I was just interested to see what would happen. So I have some just sitting, like drying kind of like this. And then I have some hanging upside down and I have some in some silica gel crystals. So we'll see what happens there. Leah said, I can't believe after all the artichokes I have consumed over the years that I had never actually seen one in full bloom. They're stunning and I can't wait to see how the drying experiments turn out. Thanks again for another informative video, Laura and Erin. You know what, I saw that comment a lot. I saw a lot of people said I'd never seen an artichoke bloom before. It's interesting to see stuff like that because I come across it every once in a while. I'm like, what is that bloom? I've never seen that before. How have I not seen that? And they're intense. I mean, this is, yeah, there's some that have even more on the top, like even more color than this. So they're really an interesting plant. Uh, Shruti said, curious as to why you buy compost and not compost at home. We're creating jobs for other people, <laughs> right? If we buy it, I just, you know, I think it's a good responsible thing to do and it's something that you're more interested in than I am. I've never been hugely interested in the whole process of composting. I've done it. I've done composting in the tumblers, in piles, vermiculture, all of it. And I think I get overwhelmed with the fact that our property is, it's like, you know, it's grown and it would take so much compost to actually like cover a lot of it but it would be a really good responsible way to turn a lot of our garden you know stuff into compost yeah you know i don't know so the things that have held me back i do i am interested in it yeah. and i would like to do it um and i'd help you as yeah, long as you were we, spearheading it. we create we create a lot and so we'd have to figure out you know how to do it where it's not super messy because we have neighbors we have neighbors and i i am worried that it could smell yeah 
Um, and so it's like, where do you where do you put the compost exactly to where it's not an eyesore, and where do you put it to where it's not a nose? Yeah, because no matter what way the wind blows, we have neighbors like neighborhoods all the way around us. We are technically county, but we are not country. We're right on the edge of town, and you know there's a whole neighborhood on one side of our property, and then we have neighbors pretty close on all the all the other sides. Yeah. So. I mean, city limits is literally like our property line, a almost. stone's throw. Yeah. You know. Mm -hmm. So. I, that's that's really kind of the thing holding us back at this point is mm -hmm. I'm I'm cautious I don't want to like set up composting behind that black fence like we had anticipated mm -hmm. because I'm I'm a little bit worried that it will smell I've been told if you're doing it correctly that it shouldn't right but man what if we don't what yeah, if we don't have the mixture just you know, right I think it's kind of inevitable at certain times if you get like an influx of moisture like that yeah. you know over inch of rain that we got that we're not nothing here is prepared to accept that including our ground um, you know, I don't know. I think that there'll be times where the balance maybe gets off a bit, especially when you're learning, mm -hmm. you know, about it. And we use every inch of that, st that area behind the orchard for storage. Yeah. I did not anticipate that, but we had a lot more stuff that and we also like to keep it very, like not stacked. We like everything to be very accessible. So in order to do that, it takes up more space mm -hmm. to be able to get it. It could be a maybe. little bit more organized. I think if, if we needed to, we could create some space but you know the compost would take up a good amount of room too because yeah. uh, with the amount of stuff we create mm -hmm. we would need to have like eight foot bays probably or even mm -hmm. 10 foot wide bays and mm -hmm. maybe like three of them yeah so you know 30 feet that takes up so Do they much need to of be that. 10 or can it be like eight not that they could that probably be like they could probably be eight <laughs> and you know we could flip them we've got the the forks mm -hmm. with the lawn with the tractor mm -hmm. so I would probably pop through that orchard fence at some point. Yeah, we have to be really careful. I yeah. almost feel like you'd want to create another barrier mm -hmm. on the inside of that fence. The Laura barrier. Have like, like two <laughs> yeah. fences? Yeah. Something like that. A metal I don't know. It, it is something that I want to do. It's just actually you know, doing it, it feels difficult. I think that you should feel proud of everything that's gone on on that property. I mean, I know it's been a joint design effort and all that, but we were just looking last night at what the property looked like eight months ago when Chad was just cutting the road in and you organized the infrastructure for all of it. Like I gave you a sketch. Mm -hmm. And so like everything that's happened out there, pretty much infrastructure wise and all the water and electrical. And I mean, it's an enormous amount of work out there. I mean, even like the dumpster enclosure was built this, this year, um, the orchard fence, the high tunnels put up, the road put in, the grass in, the, the sprinklers in, all of that stuff, it takes time, you know, to get your setup. And I think that it's been moving incredibly fast. Yeah. So I think, I mean, the berry beds are out there, the shed, we're gonna break ground on that here probably in the next, hopefully, week or two or something like that and have that done by fall, but, or not by fall, we're getting close to that. But we'll have it done by spring. By spring, <laughs> <laughs> I think that's more realistic. But yeah, I think the movement has been tremendous and um, yeah. I always feel like it could be faster though. No, <laughs> not for me. I think you're doing great. And I think if you want to put in compost back there, I mean, there's the whole high tunnel area if you want to organize behind the orchard fence. Um, but there's time. Like, I don't feel like you need to really rush yourself and mm -hmm. make, we've been really calculating about, or calculated mm -hmm. about the decisions we've made. Um, because you're such a future planner and you're like, what if we need to do this? What if we need a trailer here? What if there needs to be a truck that comes through here? Can we accommodate all of these things that could possibly happen? Yeah. Um, and so those kinds of decisions and thinking through those things can take some time. Yeah. So anyway, I don't think you should be in a huge rush or feel bad that you don't have a compost pile back there. I don't. So Jill said, I don't ever remember you talking about putting water in the hole before you put the plant in, except for trees. Have you been doing that all along? Not, no, actually we haven't. I just didn't notice, or is that a specific technique for certain situations? Everything is looking fantastic. Those artichokes are amazing. I think, and what do you think, Erin? Like we didn't do it for a while because we kind of, we were talking to some growers and things, and um, I don't think it's necessarily something you have to do. You know, like I think even Proven Winners shrub video, they you know, like how to plant a shrub video that was this year. Oh yeah. I don't think they put water in the hole, did they? They just planted it and then watered it in. There's a million ways to plant things. There is, but you know, I was really, um, I, I rely on the professionals mm -hmm. and what they recommend and it works. It works great for us in our garden, but out there, I feel like we need to like pamper. 
those plants a little bit. Well, I think it just depends on your area. You know, like, you know if you're going to be getting rain. I mean, most, most of the country gets rain, right? So, like, we live in high desert where we don't get a lot of rain. But, like, if you live somewhere where you know you've got a lot of rain coming up, maybe don't fill it with water because you know that it's going to get a bunch of water later in the right. week. Um, you just need to be thinking through... There's no one way to do it. I feel, no, I agree with that completely. And I, I feel like people can get bogged down with all the recommendations that are out there, especially if you start cruising around on the internet. It's kind of like, just pick one and do it and then see how it, how it goes and then adjust if you need to. Out there, our soil is so hard that once it, you start irrigating it, it starts to soften up tremendously. So if we can put water in that hole and kind of introduce it to the sides, like it would probably be a good idea for us to dig the hole prior, like a couple days, and fill that hole up a few times with water. It probably would just stay. And the look, water would just sit you think, there. No, it, it soaks in and then that soil, yeah, like there's right, earthworms in some, uh, the hole we just dug out the Venus dogwood that we transplanted and it didn't make it. We just dug it out and there were earthworms yeah. in that soil. There's no earthworms anywhere. And I think it's because that spot has had so much moisture or you know, it's been irrigated enough to where things kind of move around in it. Mm -hmm. So I think that it's good in that situation out there. Romy said, will you use some kind of border between the grass and mulch by the hellebores? I don't think so. I really like the look of grass straight up to mulch. As long as you can keep it tidy and like a neat line, which you guys do. I mean, you go along with the trimmer or, or whoever's mowing goes along with the trimmer and makes it look really nice. And we usually do like a um, once a year. Do you think like a once a year with a straight shovel? Go through and kind of clean up? I, you know, if you're going every week or every other week with the trimmer, I don't even know that it's really necessary unless you need to reshape it. I mean, if you right. have to reshape the border in any way, then yeah. you need the flat shovel. Yeah, because I don't think I've done a lot of our flower buds this year. I just reshaped a few and that's about it. Yeah, you're right. Sarah said, with the targeted irrigation on shrubs and trees, will you make the loop larger as the shrub grows? If not, do you have problems with the trunk rotting? Uh, we will make them larger as the trees grow. In fact, I think we're gonna just make it a, an, an annual replace. Like. You get your drip supplies, you go out, you cut all of the loops off of every single tree and shrub out there and you replace it with a new drip. And every year you can increase it by one or two emitter tubes if you need to to make it a little bit larger mm -hmm. um, because our water is so hard that it tends to plug up emitter holes. So we just thought, you know, just to know, to have peace of mind that everything's getting the water it needs, we'll just make it a once a year. It'll be easy. Mm -hmm. That's easy job to do, to go through and replace it. It's kind of mindless, right. you know. Anyway, Susan said, how do you always create the perfect drift of plants? I swear everything I have is in lines. I must learn your ways. Sometimes I don't. Sometimes I uh, have to add a plant or two or kind of shift one around. It's not like I don't have a foolproof, me foolproof method for sure. Uh, sometimes I get it right and sometimes I don't. So don't feel bad. Uh, Connie said, did you eat any of the artichokes? I did harvest, like the first harvest I made was to for eating. I You have to harvest them before the petals start to grow out. So you wanna like harvest them while everything's still pretty tight. So I did go through, I think I took a picture of the first harvest that I grabbed. And then the rest was just, I wanted to let them flower and I wanted to experiment with using them in different decorating kind of met methods, not methods, decorating. Applications. Applications, there you go. Susan said, this may be a dumb question, but if you mulch with compost, aren't you laying down the perfect conditions for Weed City? I understand you wanting to enrich the soil, but with your windy environment, isn't it a bigger concern for weed seed germination in your compost? Uh, I think weeds would germinate in anything. Around here, they just yeah. germinate like- Mulch, compost, In a matter. tiny little crack in the concrete. Yeah, like the tiniest of cracks. Yeah. No crack. Just on top of the concrete, <laughs> <laughs> I swear. If it's spurge, it will do it. Um, yeah, I'm not super concerned about that. Next video was saving seeds from the garden to plant next year, which I still have sitting next to me. These are uh, carrots. I have Orlea, Nigella. These are uh, foxglove right here. So many foxglove seeds. I still have a ton to gather just from the stuff I have in here. Um, and I haven't made it back out yet, but I just went through a few of my of my things that were ready. So uh, let's see, poppies. Oh, well, I can I can tell you right here because I can't remember. Poppy, snapdragon, dill, uh, more poppies. There's carrots, orlea, nigella, larkspur, and foxglove. I went through all those types. I showed you what the seed pods look like, and then just gathered the seed. Uh, it's really fun to do that. I also talked about the difference between hybrid and open pollinated seeds. Hybrids being a 
a plant that's been bred to retain certain specific genetic things from other plants to create like a better plant. So if you gather seeds from a hybrid plant and you plant them the next year, you're not guaranteed that you're going to actually get that specific variety that you planted the year before. So like for example, I have uh, my snapdragons right here in that envelope. I gathered some apple blossom, Potomac apple blossoms, which are a hybrid. Um, so this plant has been bred to be the apple blossom snapdragon. If I plant these seeds next year, which I will, I may not get apple blossom. I might get one of the parent varieties or something random. Uh, as opposed to open pollinated seeds like Danvers half long carrots. I only had one variety of carrots in the garden that were open pollinated. So when I gather these seeds, I know that if I plant these next year, they will still be the Danvers half longs. However, if you have more than one variety of open pollinated seeds within the same category, they can cross with one another. Um, and it's interesting because like pumpkins, for example, I grow a lot of varieties of pumpkins. A lot of them are open pollinated, but I typically don't gather the seeds on those because they'll cross with each other and the next year you will get something different. Corn cross pollinates the same year. So you plant two varieties of open pollinated corn within like, I can't remember how many yards of each other, they can cross pollinate and you will see the weird varieties show up that growing season. So like with my corn, I have two varieties. I have ambrosia growing out in our cut flower garden. I planted that three weeks prior to planting the glass gem ornamental corn which I planted up in the raised beds. And I think they're far enough apart that they wouldn't cross. Plus the ambrosia is almost done now and glass gem is just starting to tassel and form ears. So just a really interesting thing. So Barbara says, hey everyone, I'm a seed saver from the 60s, especially heritage varieties. I put my, I put my seeded plants in paper bags hanging down to dry and the seeds pop out on their own, way easier. Just a handy tip from an elderly gardener. Thank you, Barbara, for that tip. I need to do that. Maybe I'll try it with some of these because some of them like the Orlea in particular, these have spines and they hurt, but they're, I mean, they're on there pretty good. I wonder if they just need to dry out a little bit more. And I also considered just popping the seed heads off because I have so many and just turning them like upside down, putting them in the ground, putting soil over them and see what happens. Do a little more thinning that way, but then I wouldn't have to take them off the stalks. Karen said, there's something just very satisfying about saving seed and then growing from that seed the next year. How did your large tomato patch do with the Florida weave? Oh. <laughs> Not, not the best. So it was one of those areas that I planted and just, you know, there's a lot going on and so something has to give. I never even planned on planting. I just planned on putting in the four tomatoes, which I ended up with six in our main garden. Um, I put those in, they're doing great, bearing beautifully, which is the weird part. So those are huge and beautiful. And then remember last year, my tomatoes, I had 30 tomato plants out in the new property. They were like, beastly tomato plants, huge. And I had such a huge crop. I don't know if it's like the location, they're on the far side of the field. I mean, I don't know what the difference is. They have the same kind of water, same, you know, I did biotone and land and sea at planting, but I've actually had to pull probably six of those tomatoes I pulled because I just like kind of withered up and died. The rest of them, we've had intense heat. So a lot of them, like the leaves have just kind of like folded in. Um, and some of them have grown and Paul bless his heart. He's been keeping up on just keeping the string going, but I don't, I don't want to show it. Like it was just a complete blah. Like I could just pull everything probably. We probably just should pull yeah. it and try again next year because it was just a forgotten area. And I kind of just like need to, when I, when I want to plant 40 some tomato plants, just be like, no. Just don't do it. Just, yeah. <laughs> not, at least not on a year where we've got so many other things going on and you know, a new baby in the house, which she's almost seven months old. What day is today? Two days away from being seven months old, which is crazy, but I need to know my limits sometimes. And that was just an area that got kind of tossed, I guess. Connor said, how do you plant those seeds? They're so small. Do you just dump a bunch of seeds in one area? I don't imagine you'd plant one tiny seed. Typically like for um, foxgloves, for example, like they are really tiny. I'm usually doing that from seed uh, like in trays. And so I'm somewhere a little bit more, like when I'm outside planting in rows, I just kind of take a pinch of seed and do this. I don't really try to um, necessarily meter out my seeds, unless it's like big seeds, beans and corn, you can really see the difference. And I do two seeds per hole. For foxgloves, even though they're so tiny, I usually end up with like three or four probably seeds in each one of my little cells. Then I have to thin them out later. Uh, but you kind of get in kind of a roll. You kind of, I don't know. Yeah, and then you get a little bit used to it after you've done it a little while. Elizabeth said, do you need to cold stratify these seeds before sowing this spring? I think the only ones you have to do that with are the larkspur. 
Um, and I think the package recommends like three to four weeks of cold stratification, like in the fridge, which I cleaned our fridge out last night and I found two packs of Larkspur seeds. Oh, really? From like two years ago. <laughs> I've cleaned the fridge out since two years ago, but they weren't from this spring. So they had to have been from the previous spring. Wow. Yeah. Like, you set an alarm on your phone to go off to remind you to take them out. Yeah, or set an alarm to keep cleaning out the refrigerator, <laughs> like maybe more thoroughly. Um, anyway, I did not cold stratify, 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 is that right? That sounds, doesn't sound right. I didn't cold stratify my seeds this spring. I just planted them out, and I think it was early enough that they got enough cold that they were fine. They all came up beautifully. Uh, Gina said, can't you just leave them in the garden? They will reseed themselves in the ground and throw, ne uh, throw next season and through next season. Uh, yeah, they would probably release seed and they probably already have. Oh, I know they have. I know the lark spurs, they have a bunch of pods with no seeds in them. So no, they've dropped. But, you know, I typically don't like to leave my plants up because I like to move stuff around. I want to crop rotate. I want to plant things in a different kind of design. And we don't let a lot of things just like naturalize out there. So if we see little things coming up somewhere where we didn't, we planted something different or uh, whatever, we just weed them out. Um, so, yeah. Raymond said, unrelated question for Aaron. How many gu guitars do you own? Oh, huh. And any favorite brands or models? I thought that was an interesting question because Aaron does play the guitar. Yeah, um, I own one guitar currently. It's a Taylor 310 CE. It's a 25th anniversary model. And I used to have a Taylor 614 CE, which was much nicer, but I sold it because I was young and I needed money. <laughs> so maybe one day I'll get another, you know, really nice guitar. The one I have now is nice, but it, you know, it's also been like well-traveled, I guess. So there's lots of dings and scratches and things like that. Probably a good one for the kids if they want to play I on. don't play it nearly enough. No, you don't I play really it I really need to get it out more. The kids yeah. love it when I when I get the guitar out. Mm -hmm. You should. I don't think you have for Samantha yet, have you? No, I haven't. You really should. She would, we had uh, Bohemian Rhapsody playing the other night. You yeah. just played it randomly because yeah. uh, Benjamin likes to dance to that song. Anyway, Samantha sang, like just yeah, sang the, the, whole song. the entire song. She was loving it. Yeah. Anyway, she would probably love that. My dad just got, my mom got my dad a Taylor guitar. What is that one? A Taylor 814 CE. For it's Father's Day. beautiful. And he doesn't play the guitar. No, <laughs> but he's wanted to learn. So my mom's like, well, I'll get him a guitar. It is such a nice guitar. Yeah. Like, you it's just trade with my dad. really nice guitar. <laughs> Let him learn on that other one. Yeah, I'd love, I'd love to be a great trade. <laughs> Uh, Debbie said, talking about seeds, where did you buy the cucumber seeds for the bush type you grew? You said they gave you an abundance of fruit. Over 200 cucumbers at this point. They're called salad bush cucumbers. I didn't buy them from seed. I got them from plants at my parents' garden center. And I'm telling you what, they're not, they're not pickling type cucumbers. They're regular size cucumbers. And the plants are like maybe what, this big each? They're just small little plants at the end of my sweet pea rose. And they are just, they've produced like beasts, like beasts. And they're just still producing every single day. I have to like pick them like zucchini. That's how fast they're producing. So salad bush is the variety. Cindy said, if the seed pods do break open and seeds uh, spread seed on the ground, is there a chance that their flowers will grow from the seeds? Yes, there is. I guess it depends on what kind they are, right? Uh, pretty much, I would assume if they got the right conditions once they hit the ground, I mean, that's what happens in nature. You know, plants throw their seeds everywhere. And if everything happens right, that if they get the amount of moisture they need and all that sort of thing, then yeah, you should get flowers from them. Uh, Angela said, aren't you thrilled you moved your plant slash grow room out of your house? Yes. What has that room become now? Nothing. It's a clean room. I That's need the to... room that the tree would fall on if the juniper ever fell. Yeah, so There's nobody's bedroom will ever be in that room. Um, it, well, it'll be a guest room. <laughs> <laughs> it'll be a guest room at some point. That's the plan anyway. I actually was having, uh, I had a contract, well, we had a contractor over just to kind of talk through some maybe future plans for the house. And I was thinking, you know how we have a balcony over, like off of our master bedroom over the, overlooking the Versailles garden. I thought it'd be really pretty over that back sun porch to have some double doors coming out that room and having a little porch built on top of the sun porch with like the same kind of white railing. Mm -hmm. um, and it's underneath a, a maple tree, so it'd be very protected. It'd be a beautiful spot to sit. Mm -hmm. Way nicer than the balcony because the balcony is hot. It is hot. Most of the year it's hot. 
even in the spring and the fall because it, the sun hits it in the morning and nothing like it's so protected right there it just soaks the heat in and it just stays there so we hardly ever use that space which is a shame um, but it would be pretty to kind of like try to marry the two sides a bit and have another balcony there at some point. I don't know if that's a reality. Maybe it's not, it's fun to dream about those things, but uh, I thought it would be a beautiful guest room because it's so light and airy and it's a little bit bigger. Um, anyway, I don't know. Helen said, do you date your seeds? How long will they last? I do not date my seeds. I feel like I go through them fast enough. Um, seeds last a really long time. Um, I know down at the garden center when we were selling, when they still sell seeds, but when I was down there, um, we would germ test any seeds that we had in our bulk bins from year to year uh, because you couldn't, we couldn't sell seeds with less than a certain percentage of germination. It depends on the, the kind. Um, so you'd have to germ like 100 seeds and figure out what percentage you know came up and all that business. But it seemed like onions, tomatoes, and peppers lost germ at a higher rate than the rest of seeds. A lot of seeds, as long as you keep them in a dry location, they'll last for a long, 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 long time. And if I have anything, like I had a few pumpkin packets um, that I know I bought when we lived in our old townhouse and I didn't plant them there, like I just had had them. I, I, I don't know what I was thinking because I didn't have enough room to, I mean, you guys know, you get excited and you buy things that maybe a plant that won't fit somewhere properly. So I had those for a lot of years and I just make sure to plant extra seeds. So instead of planting three or five seeds in a hill, I would plant like 10 seeds and then I would make sure to get what I needed in that, that hill. Uh, last video from this week was raised bed vegetable garden tour and maintenance, which in that video, I kind of toured you guys through how our raised bed area is doing just to show you what's in there. Uh, and then I went bed by bed and maintained, kind of talked through what had been in there this spring, what was in there now, and then maintained what needed to be maintained and harvested some things. And um, I don't know how you feel, how that video came out. When I was watching it back, I feel like I talked way too much, like gave way too many details. I think people must have liked it because in creator studio it shows you how well your video is performing versus the last 10 videos mm -hmm. and it's three out of ten is it really so that means it's third place compared to the last 10 videos we've uploaded oh i was a little worried you know we do so many videos that every once in a while you do one where you're like oh i don't know i don't know if this turned was out good that was a good video i'm well i'm glad i'm happy with everything that got done in that video top comment uh was from zio not only was the content of this video really fun and informative but the format and editing are also excellent so there you go <laughs> awesome. <laughs> that's awesome did you do all the filming laura uh no i did not this time aaron was out there helping me which is a tremendous help um when you have to do the garden project and you film yourself which i do a, a lot it just takes a lot longer it's a, a lot more to to think about it's more it's a not autopilot but it's a little bit more for me now like it doesn't take me as long as it used to but it's still a tremendous amount of work so it's nice when both of us are out there and it was a hot day it was 106 that day and um so you like had your cameras with the umbrella out and trying to get them to not overheat mm -hmm. and things like that so there's all those other things that happen because you can't have your camera overheating at a pivotal moment like when you're harvesting a tomato that's a pivotal moment you want to capture you know and so like you have to kind of be on it um, Kathy said, are the ARBs having issues in that area? A few of them are. We're not exactly sure what has happened. So there's a couple of things. The ARBs right behind the greenhouse. Remember we planted our first North Pole Arborvitas back there, five of them right behind the greenhouse. Then we came in later and planted five more. All of them back there are like close to death. And it, what to me, what based on like seeing plants throughout the years and kind of being able to diagnose what's going on, it looks like they got sprayed. I think that's what happened uh, because they are on the same water line as all our other arbs, which most of them along that line are doing really well, except for a couple behind the vegetable garden. Um, it looks like, because they started looking, looking poorly last year. And I think because, it, you know, this is where the tanks, the backpack tanks can get mixed up. I think those got sprayed with a weed spray instead of the dead bug spray to keep the cobwebs off of them. I think that's what happened because they started to decline all of them. So it's not a water, it's not a water issue when every single one of them looks the same. Um, and so we started to like really test the water in that area. We were deep soaking them, trying to figure out there what they weren't sitting in water. So it wasn't that, and it, that, that brown just kept on like, like cruising through the plant. And you think then it's possible there could be like a gopher run that's no. just going right through all of them. Well, anything's possible, but I don't think so. 
I haven't seen any evidence of a gopher in that area. Right. It looks like they were sprayed. They tried to come out of it last year, and then with the intense heat, they just are toast. And so I think that's what happened, and we just didn't know about it. Uh, Denise said, thanks for the update. Saw the pink spray paint on your driveway. Are you getting ready to embark on a new project? Yes, um, it's one we've talked to you guys about before. We are gonna be retrofitting our cold frame, which is right in front of me. It runs parallel to the barn. We're gonna retrofit that and heat it. Uh, this winter, we're gonna try that out. Um, actually, Jenny and Jerry from Creekside Nursery, they are flying out at the end of next month. Um, they've done this to a couple of their greenhouses, so they're gonna walk us through the process and we'll do a video of it. It'll be really fun. I'm really looking forward to it. So uh, power came out and located where their line was. And so we're gonna be running a gas trench from the natural gas near our house out to the cold frame. So that's gonna happen here. Which they, they put a T in the line under the driveway because I told them at the time they were putting it in for the house, I said, you know, we may one day want to run it out to the barn or the cold frame. Mm -hmm. And they're like, oh, okay, well, we'll just put like a T right here. And then if we ever run out there, it'll just be right Easy there. So access. we don't have to tear up any of the flower beds. Or the brick walkway. I yeah. mean, have you, that's what future planning does when you have somebody who can think through like what could, what could we possibly want to do here? What could make it easier? So there's like conduit everywhere throughout our entire property so that we can run stuff wherever we need to run stuff. And that's so nice. Uh. Good job, Aaron. Phyllis said, I noticed when you're watering in, you don't get the top leaves wet. Is there a reason for that? A couple reasons. In some areas, I mean, it's it's just a good idea not to get the leaves wet. In the humid areas, especially where you deal with fungal issues, that's not so much a concern here. For us, it's a hard water issue. If we overhead water, they get white hard water spots on them and it looks horrible. And if a plant gets coated too much in hard water, it'll eventually kind of like almost strangle out the plant. That doesn't happen too often in our garden because we do everything except for the grass with drip irrigation. Kelly said, what size is the fenced in garden space? Erin, you may have to help me remember, but I think from like the arb line, so like the gar where the gravel starts in front of the arbs, so fence, arbs, gravel, it's 21 feet from where the gravel starts to the fence. Well, that sounds right. And then I think it's 53 feet long. That's rough, but I think that's pretty close. 21 by 53. Why did you decide on 53 feet? Maybe it was 54. No. <laughs> I know you were limited in space on how far you could come out because there's the driveway. Yeah. So there's only so much space there. Right. But lengthwise. Well, I think I did halves. I did halves in between some of the beds. Mm. And so it ended up being an odd number. I oh. don't know. Maybe mm. it did. Maybe it didn't. But that's rough. Maybe it was 50 feet. 52 feet. Close. Liam Haynes said, which type of raised beds do you have? Only the wooden frame with no bottom part or with the bottom part? What we have are just frames that have no bottom. So what we did in that area is we excavated it. You guys know there was an elm tree there that was diseased. There was a dog kennel with a concrete pad. There was also a concrete weir underneath that area. Had all of it removed and a fence that ran in front of it. Jeez, you just forget about all those things. Mm -hmm. Gosh, the infrastructure is just crazy. There was also an electrical pole that we had buried right there. Like all of it came together right where that vegetable garden space is. Speaking of that, you know, I'm glad you said that because I'm going to have to remind the Cascade Natural Gas guys when they come trench, they're probably going to hit that old uh, Oahe oh, irrigation right. line. Yeah. That like concrete. Yeah. So they'll, they'll try to go through and it's abandoned. It's been cut multiple times, uh -huh. but. But they'll run into they'll it. They'll run into the same. it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Anyway, so what we did is we cleared the whole area, had it leveled, and then we put landscape fabric down on the whole thing and then put our beds on top of the landscape fabric, which we used two by 12 redwood for our beds. Not in the beginning, we had smaller ones in the beginning, but we ended up with two by 12s, which I really like. Uh, and we set the frames down on top of the uh, landscape fabric and then we cut the landscape fabric out from underneath the interior of the beds. So that we've got, you know, a good 10 inches or so of fill in those beds and then the plants can still go down and tap into our native soil for whatever good that will do um, um, in our native soil. But things do really well. We filled those beds with a specific garden raised bed blend from a place called Cloverdale Nursery in Boise. It's called Premium Garden Mix. It's 56% premium topsoil, 34% cascade compost, and 10% composted manure. And you guys, that stuff is good. It's good, good stuff. And then every year when I uh, do new crops, I add in biotone starter fertilizer and I also add in um, 
land and sea compost. Anne said, are you overwhelmed yet? I know I would be. There's so much to take care of and remember that you need to do a certain task. I only have a half acre, which we expanded to this year. I know you have help, which we do. Never forget that everybody, we do have help. And that is key. Like we couldn't do it without the help we have. We couldn't do it without you guys watching our videos. And I know we're incredibly blessed to be in the position we are to be able to do these projects and share them with you. And it's an incredible, it's like a really incredible thing, but it does at times get a little bit overwhelming because there's a lot going on. Yeah. And I am a type of person who likes to see closure to projects and likes to see things buttoned up and likes to have things tidy, tidy and mulched, you know, that kind of thing. Um, I like to have my ducks in a row. Like when you have people over, I'm the type, it does, things don't need to be like immaculately clean, but I like things to be picked up. And I feel that way a lot about our garden. Like I would love to give you tours all the time but I feel like I'd have to pick up all those pieces and have it look nice all the time, which is not reality. Who's that reality for? Like, you know? No one. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, we, we have a very different approach and I think we kind of are a good blend because I think I can tend to slow you down enough to maybe think about some of the decisions because I know sometimes you're thankful that we didn't yeah. go a certain route. Right. And then you are good at kind of pulling me along. I mean, like, let's just, let's go, let's, let's do these things, you know? Mm. And then I'm always so happy to have them done. Yeah. And like all the infrastructure and stuff, I would have never done that. Right. You know, I'm like, mm, you know, I'm so thankful it's there. So we're a really good blend that way. Like right now I'm trying to pull you along to get the power out to the greenhouse, the Hartley. Yeah. Because if we don't tear up that walkway and get power in there, like we won't have power this We this don't winter. have anybody to do it right now though. I told Aaron, like I would be making decisions a lot quicker if people were getting out here a lot quicker. I feel like yeah. I'm really good at making a decision right now. Like you're here with the excavator, boom, put it right there. Yeah, Like right. that's where you put the hole. Yeah. I can make decisions like on the spot. Right. But I'm not as good about thinking. I just don't think about stuff like you do. I just, I don't mull stuff over. Mm -hmm. I'm just not a planner that way at all. That's why I'm really horrible at like, sharing future landscape plans you, know what they are. you were asking me about trees last night you're yeah. like can you just give me a rough di a rough idea of where we should put trees out on the new lawn i'm like well i think no. i asked you like in your mind how many trees do you envision that we'll put on the west side of the new lawn and you were like oh i don't know i haven't thought about it i was like you have in your mind's eye you haven't even like you haven't thought about doing a grove of trees or doing one tree or something in between? I know there'll be trees. <laughs> <laughs> I just can't fathom that there isn't even a thought. Like you haven't put a single well, thought to it. Well, the whole design out there was a five minute sketch. Yeah. Like it just has to happen. Like weird. I don't, I know, I'm sorry. I'm a very difficult person to work <laughs> with. Uh, 208. Bonstrom said, are the garden gem tomatoes good for slicing and sandwiches or are they intended for cooking and canning? You can use them any way you want, which is the best part. I have a basket full of them sitting on my counter that I intend to make into sauce to can, um, but we've also been using them a lot on BLTs. I love to slice them up because I can fit six slices on my bread. And um, yeah, I just, they're tasty and they're just so versatile. I love them. And that is it. That is all the questions. I, that was probably, I had to change my battery but in the middle of this. Yeah, well, like, yeah, I think it might be one of the longest <laughs> recaps. Yeah. We'll see. We'll see what happens. Thank you guys so much for hanging out with us today. I hope it was helpful to hear some of the answers to the questions and hope you're having a great week. We will see you in the next video. Bye.